<laughs> Your Olympic hero has arrived. It's true. It's true. You're watching Fugitive Red Eye, and welcome to another review. Today I'll be reviewing the finale to Red vs. Blue. That being Red vs. Blue Restoration, which is the final season, quote-unquote, but also the movie finale. Uh, it was released as a single movie instead of being released as a season because Rooster Teeth went out of business. Rooster Teeth is over, Red vs. Blue is over. They started with Red vs. Blue, they went out with Red vs. Blue. And uh, even though all of the seasons refer to themselves as movies on the DVD discs, they're still seasons because they were released episodically. This is referred to as a movie by basically any source you look at, even though it is the same length as some of the seasons, or at least pretty comparable. Uh, it's actually on the shorter side of the seasons, which I guess you could say would make it more like a movie, but it's not even the shortest season. I'm pretty sure some of the Blood Gulch seasons were shorter than this. Uh, as you guys know, I don't like Rooster Teeth and what they've become. I really hate what happened with what they did to Joel Heyman, uh, and obviously I don't want to support them, but they went out of business. Uh, I didn't actually buy this. Uh, Spencer did. Uh, he's a friend of mine. He was in town, he bought it, we signed into his Amazon, and we watched it. Uh, so let's go ahead and just dive in. Red vs. Blue Restoration. Obviously the naming conventions, they're going back to The Recollection, which I thought was kind of cool. Obviously The Recollection being seasons 6, 7, and 8 being Reconstruction, Recreation, and Revelation. This was written by Bernie Burns, this, this movie was, which... The last time Red vs. Blue was written by Bernie Burns was during Revelation, which again was season 8, so it's been quite a while. Uh, if we're counting this as a season, this would be season 19. Uh, so going into this, there was a lot of things I had on my mind. Number one, Joel Heyman's gone. They fucked him over and kicked him out of a company that he helped found. So with that being the case, who's gonna play Caboose? And they had another guy playing Caboose. He did an okay job. He certainly wasn't Joel Heyman. There were moments where he sounded really, really off. There were moments where he sounded almost passable. With Bernie Burns returning as writer, I initially read an article that said he would not voice Church. However, he did, in fact, voice Church. Uh, so looking into it, I found out what the confusion was. Bernie did not play Lopez in this season. Uh, he was played by a Hispanic guy. So my guess is it's a similar situation to how Apu and Dr. Hibbert in The Simpsons got recast. Which, it's really a weird virtue signal to me, especially with Lopez, because he's literally a fucking robot, but whatever. But really, I just misread the article. It wasn't Church that he wasn't playing. He always intended to play Church. It was Lopez. I just misread it, so that's my mistake. And we'll get one thing right out the gate here, at the start. Lopez is in this for, like, one scene. I don't get why, because he was fucking there. But he's there at the beginning, and then he's just never seen again. They don't kill him off, they don't write him out, he just doesn't do anything. Now you may be wondering how the hell do they have Church in this? They actually had a really clever way to do that. Church left a series of recordings, Epsilon did. Uh, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. Let's first talk about the continuity of this season. This season only acknowledges the first 13 seasons. It completely ignores the Shizno trilogy and Red vs. Blue Zero. Which I think is the right move because those seasons fucking suck. Now that said, I have not actually seen the ending of the Shizno trilogy, which would be Singularity, and I have also not seen Red vs. Blue Zero. Uh, but I did see Season 15 and the Shizno Paradox, which was Season 16. But that also adds an extra layer to the title Restoration, because it's forgetting about the bad stuff. So that's good that it made the bad seasons not canon. So going into this, obviously, like I said, Caboose sounded weird because he wasn't Joel Heyman. But even the characters that were reprising their roles sounded a bit odd to me. For instance, Wash sounded kind of odd. A lot of them did at different moments, but I think what it is is it's because they're a lot older now and because they're using different equipment that maybe it just sounds weird to me listening to it now because I mainly just rewatch seasons 1 through 10 and then occasionally watch the Chorus trilogy. Because as I've said multiple times, like I always felt that the show really ended in season 10 and I'll let you know what I think about that at the end of this anyway. Uh, but let's talk about the plot of this movie. So, there will be spoilers ahead, just so you guys know. I'm gonna delve into spoilers. There's some pretty big ones. Uh, it's pretty eventful, because it's the finale. So, the premise of this movie is that the Reds and Blues have been hiding out since Chorus. Turns out Church's sacrifice, Epsilon's sacrifice that he did to save them, worked out. And it's revealed that all of the bad seasons were just simulations that Epsilon conducted of potential ways that it could have gone with his plan working. So those were all simulations and didn't happen. 
So this picks up after chorus. It's sometime later. The Reds and Blues have been in hiding. Uh, then there's a convention. This scene's really weird. I'll talk about it a little more later. Uh, but it's really weird and meta. And uh, there's a convention. They're talking about the Reds and Blues. And then the meta shows up, which... The meta is the villain in this. The meta is back. However, it's not Agent Main. Uh, for those of you who remember what happens at the end of the Chorus trilogy, this is actually a detail I forgot. Spencer had to remind me, and also they reminded me in the show by showing kind of a recap of it. Uh, Tucker put on Agent Main's armor and had all of the AI powers activated through Epsilon, which is how the cliffhanger happened. I knew Epsilon was involved. I remember the cliffhanger speech he gives at the end. But I forgot the context that it was Tucker's armor that was doing it. Well... Having Epsilon use all of the AI abilities and personalities at once uh, brought him so that he becomes the meta. Uh, it drives Tucker crazy, and Tucker becomes the meta now. So Tucker is the meta. Tucker is the villain of this season. So we don't really have a ton of proper Tucker scenes because most of the time he's the meta. Epsilon left a series of recorded messages in Caboose's helmet. Why Caboose's helmet? Because Caboose has an older helmet that doesn't link up to command, so no one can actually get it remotely. They would have to go to his helmet to get the messages. And he may, he convinced the AIs, uh, and the AIs that are in the meta are convinced that Epsilon is still intact within Caboose's armor. Obviously, that's not the case, as Epsilon destroyed himself doing the heroic act at the end of Season 13. Uh, these recordings are, res is res are responding to the characters uh, because... They're all predictable, so he knew what they would say given the scenarios. That's a clever way to write Epsilon slash Church back into the back into the episode, back into the series, uh, in order to get it across without undermining the cliffhanger that he had at the end of season thirteen. This way, they don't undermine the sacrifice, and he's still there, albeit as a recording. Uh, I will also say Donut does not actually appear in this at all. He's not in this season slash movie, whatever you want to call it, at all. Other than a brief sort of cameo and a kind of, like, flashback sort of thing uh, that Griff has towards the end. Uh, so Donut's not really in it, unfortunately. Donut is absent. Anyway, they go to retrieve Epsilon's memory unit and, uh, and recovery pod uh, to prevent it from falling into the hands of the meta. And also, they can use it to defeat the meta by harnessing all of the AIs and gathering them all into the recovery unit. The memory unit is used later, and I'll talk to that a little bit more when we get to the final battle. Meanwhile, Wash has been put in sort of an institution where he's there with Doc, who's also looking after him. Wash finds out about the meta's return, and nobody at the institution except for Doc believes him. Wash does, of course, escape, and he does, he does show up in time for the final battle. Although, admittedly, he doesn't do a ton in this movie, but we'll go over that better. At least he's not retarded like he was in the Shizno trilogy. Because if you guys don't remember, they literally made him brain damaged post-chorus in uh, seasons 15 and 16. It was really bad. Anyway, they go to the facility, they have a brief encounter with the meta there, and they are able to retrieve the units, uh, but then the meta, of course, takes them, and so the meta now has the recovery unit, but Caboose manages to grab the memory unit. However, uh, the Reds flee, and Caboose is left there on his own with the meta, and it looks like the meta's gonna fucking kill him. But then Sarge has a change of, change of heart, and realizes Caboose is one of them. So Sarge goes back and fights the meta. Uh, he shoots the hell out of him with his shotgun, actually being competent for once, saving Caboose and, and bringing them back to the ship to leave the base where the meta is. However, the meta gets one final stab in, and... Major spoiler, kills Sarge. Sarge dies. He dies in this movie. Uh, before he dies, he gives a speech to Griff about the reason he was so tough on him, being because he wanted Griff to succeed and knew he could do better, so he had to keep pushing him. He said he believed in Griff even when Griff didn't believe in himself. He says his goodbyes to all the characters. He dies. They bury him in Blood Gulch and have a funeral back in Blood Gulch. Shortly after that, they go to the memory unit with Caboose and all start reminiscing about Church. Uh, at this point, uh, Church, uh, at this point, the memory unit is being used to get all their memories to bring back what they think is going to be Church uh, in order to help them in the fight. 
Uh, I kind of picked up on what it was actually going to be when they started talking a lot about Tex. Caboose started going into a lot of detail about Tex, and as you can guess, it's Tex that comes back. So they bring back Tex using the memory unit and the spare robot body. Uh, the meta shows up in Blood Gulch. They have a big battle, which, again, it's, I say big, but it's actually pretty short. All of the fights in this are relatively short, which we'll get into a little more later when I actually start talking about my analysis. But a big fight breaks out. Uh, eventually, they defeat the meta. Uh, Doc uses his recovery beacon by jumping off a cliff, uh, which summons Carolina to him. It's then revealed by Carolina that Doc has been dead the whole time. Doc actually died on Chorus, so he's just a hallucination left in Doc, uh, left in Wash's mind because Wash feels guilty that Doc sacrificed his own life to save Wash. I thought that was a great twist. Uh, it's also sad because now two characters were killed off. Sarge and Doc were both killed off. Uh, then in the fight, they use the, the, they use the recovery unit to get all the AIs out of Tucker, defeating the meta. It also takes in Tex and Church. Uh, so all of the AIs have now been gathered into this unit. And while in the unit, uh, Tex and Church have like sort of a uh, sweet moment where she says she'll explain everything. Uh, and then the memory unit is then destroyed. So Church and Tex are also killed off permanently. Uh, Tucker recovers. Uh, Griff is dismissed by Simmons because Simmons was promoted. He lets Griff go. He actually dismissed Griff earlier, but Griff decided to stick around for one last adventure, one last mission. Uh, so Griff leaves, he says his goodbyes to Griff, uh, and, uh, that's it. That's the end of it. They defeat it, Tucker's back to normal, Sarge and Doc are dead, and, uh, Griff is leaving. Uh, so overall, what did I think of this movie? Well, it's a very interesting case, because a lot of what this movie has feels like it gets so close to feeling like Red vs. Blue. It has a lot of callbacks. There's a lot of nostalgia coming in there. It's making you feel like, oh, this is red versus blue again. This is really the ending. It starts to kind of feel like that at times. But I'm going to be honest. There's something just kind of off. The whole thing just feels hollow. The plot and the story is well written. What happens in the story makes sense and makes it feel like it would be the finale. But it just feels empty. It feels like it's never really reaching that full potential. It feels like a shell of Red vs. Blue. Like, it's definitely better than the Shizno, than the Shizno trilogy, and from what I've been told, it's better than Zero, too, and it's sure as hell better than Season 14. But I remember, in the scene where Sarge dies, I remember I literally said, this is a good scene, I really like this speech, but I feel nothing. I should be feeling something. Sarge is one of my favorite characters, and he's there dying, and I feel nothing for it. There is no emotion. And it's not like this show can't elicit emotions from me. It's done it so many times before. This is one of my favorite dramedies. But I felt nothing when Sarge was dying. And I felt nothing in the final battle, even though it was relatively cool. It was short. So I think maybe there are factors that go into this. Obviously, I'm biased against Rooster Teeth. It's a company that I just don't like anymore, even though I used to love them and their work. Uh, obviously, that's due in part to the Joel Heyman stuff, the Vic Mignogna stuff. They fucked over a lot of people that I like and handled it in ways that I obviously didn't like. Uh, the Vic Mignogna stuff was one moment that obviously pissed me off because they joined in on the bandwagon with Funimation and canceling Vic Mignogna and uh, making him lose a lot of his career. But the Joel Heyman stuff was like the final nail in the coffin for me with Rooster Teeth. That's why I never watched any of the new stuff until this. Like, Shizno Paradox was the last one I watched before this. I never watched Singularity or Zero. So maybe that's a factor. Maybe it felt hollow to me because I didn't like Rooster Teeth. Maybe that's part of it. But another part of it is the music's not the same. It's very sad and melancholic music. Uh, that also feels kind of hollow, like you don't got any Trocadero in it. Trocadero did the soundtrack for most of Red vs. Blue, basically all of it except this. Uh, and from what I understand, that's because Rooster Teeth and Trocadero couldn't come to an agreement on how the music would be used, and so they went with an original soundtrack instead. So we don't get any remixes of Blood Gulch Blues, we don't get Texas theme when she starts kicking ass, like, a lot of the iconic songs aren't there, so maybe that's a part of it too. Maybe the fact that Joel Heyman isn't in it and Caboose doesn't sound like Caboose is part of it. 
Maybe it's partly because I think, in all honesty, it's too short. Despite the fact that I think the story and plot is interesting, not a whole hell of a lot actually happens in this movie. Everything happens relatively quickly, and it moves from one plot point to the next, and it doesn't feel like anything is ever accomplished. Again, character deaths feel hollow in this. Maybe it's the short time frame, maybe it's the fact that it's shorter than a lot of the seasons. Like I said, it's not actually the shortest season, but it is shorter than most of them. A lot of them were a lot longer than this. Maybe it's because the fight scenes were anticlimactic and uh, all were very short-lived, like it was like a couple of punches and then it's basically over. Like, there's a little bit more to it than that. Obviously, they do some stuff with the weapons, and there's a couple of cool little flips and shit they do. Uh, but obviously, this isn't Monty, right? Monty was obviously the king when it came to the fight scenes in Red vs. Blue in seasons 8 through 10. And uh, even though the chorus trilogy didn't have Monty, I still liked those fight scenes better than these ones. So, I don't know. There's so many factors and mixed feelings in this going in. It just feels like uncanny. Like, it feels like... This should be red versus blue. This should be what I like. I should like this. But there's like, it's almost like there's nothing there. It's almost like there's not really a soul to it. But there definitely is because they clearly wrote the characters in ways that were good send-offs to the characters. But I feel nothing. I feel hollow when these scenes are happening. And I want to feel more. I want to feel sad that Sarge is dead. I want to feel sad that Doc is dead. I want to feel sad that Church and Tex are gone forever. I want to feel sad that Griff is leaving. Uh, but another thing that was really weird about this movie was there was some meta-humor that was really out of place. For instance, the beginning of the movie takes place at this convention that is kind of being meta and addressing Red vs. Blue almost as a series. And then Sister, Griff's sister, Kikanya Griff or whatever her name is, comes out and is giving a speech, uh, and then that gets attacked by the meta. That convention scene was already really fucking weird. Uh, but then when Epsilon shows up to explain what's happening, it does it in the format of a YouTube video that he made in a cartoon 2D style. And it's just really odd. Like, Red vs. Blue isn't exactly a stranger to meta-humor. They rake references to Halo and the real world from time to time. But this was much more overt and out of place. Now, they did have overt meta-humor in the PSAs, but those were non-canon and were done as promotional stuff that was also gags. So, I don't know, that felt really out of place. And like I said, because of how short it is, there also just doesn't seem to feel like a sense of adventure. Like, you don't really feel like they go on a journey uh, because they just kind of jump from one location to the next in the scenes. Uh, and it's not, like, abrupt or anything. It's just you don't get a lot of breathing room. But, like, here's the thing. Even though I say that, it's still relatively slowly paced in a weird way that makes it feel odd. Uh, like I said, it's really weird, because it feels so hollow. Like, it feels like there's so many pieces of the puzzle that are there, but they just don't click. Wash doesn't actually do anything for most of the movie until he shows up at the end. Like, most of it, he's just talking to the people in that institution he's in, saying, come on, you need to let me do this, I need to stop this. And then finally he shows up in Blood Gulch, jumps and hurts himself enough to activate his recovery beacon so that Carolina will drop in. And that's, like, the extent of what Wash does. Again, I like the reveal that Doc was in his head the whole time. That was sweet. It was sad. But, again, I didn't, like, tear up. I didn't feel like... Like, I don't have to necessarily tear up for it to be sad, obviously. But, like, it felt like I want to feel more from this. And I would have felt more from this if it was the other shows. Another thing is, it's also made in Halo Infinite. And I fucking hate the aesthetic of Halo Infinite. It does not look like Halo to me. Um, you know, like, there's pieces... Halo Infinite similar in a vein, actually, where it's got a lot of the pieces there, but none of them feel like they click. Um, so I was put off by that, too, that it was made in Halo Infinite, because I really hate the way that looks. And you compare the final battle in this to the final battle in Season 10, or you compare the ending of this to the cliffhanger in Season 13, it just doesn't have the same impact. And it feels like it should... Like, there's so many pieces there. Like, I don't know why. I know I'm just kind of repeating myself, but I wanted to like this. I wanted this to be great. And I liked it to enough, but it's hollow. It's It falls flat. Like, I don't know if the execution was pulled off wrong, if it's too little too late. Maybe it's just that the show's time has passed and I've moved on. Maybe there is something genuinely wrong with it. Maybe there's not. It's really hard to tell, and I feel very conflicted about this. It was better than I thought it would be. But at the same time, 
it's a weird facsimile of Red vs. Blue. It's like it's like a skinwalker of Red vs. Blue. It's wearing its skin. It's shape-shifting into it. It's really convincing at times that it is the real thing. But at the end of the day, it's not. It's an imitation. And while, yes, it's the send-off, yes, it's the ending, Rooster Teeth is also gone, and it's poetic that they ended on Red vs. Blue, it's very hard for me to actually say it's good. There are good elements there. The pieces of the puzzle are there. So, do I recommend this movie? Well, let me tell you this. If you're the kind of person that wants to see everything Red vs. Blue and see the end of it, what, like, the final thing they, they'll ever make of it, then yes. If you're the kind of person that really liked the Chorus trilogy, but wishes you could see the outcome of the cliffhanger, and you hated the Shizno trilogy, yes, this is a good resolution to the cliffhanger from the Chorus trilogy. But, is this as good as Season 10? Hell no. Is this as good as the Chorus trilogy? Hell no. Is this as good as The Recollection? Hell no. Is this as good as Blood Gulch? I would still say no. Is it more emotional than Blood Gulch? Sure, but do I feel those emotions? No, I don't. Like I said, it's a very weird experience. I've never felt this conflicted about watching something ever before. And it's sad. I feel sad that I don't feel sad with these characters that I've grown up with and loved for a lot of my life being sent off forever. But anyway, I'm rambling at this point. It is a good movie, but it's hollow. I hope you enjoyed. I hope I explained myself well. I still think the real ending of Red vs. Blue is season 10, but this is something, and it is better than a lot of what they've done. And it is, I guess, a good send-off to the characters, even if it does fall flat. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed. This is Fugitive Red Eye. Have a good one. Doodles. You take forever to say nothing. Subscribe to Fugitive Red Eye.